Hi there, this is C. Anderson, and I am a Disciple Making Movement trainer and coach. And I'm excited to be here today again for our weekly Friday Q&A on Disciple Making Movements, how to multiply disciples in your context among the unreached, how to see disciple making groups formed, how to see those multiply. And every week I'm here at eight o'clock to answer questions, 8 a.m. Central or Minneapolis time to answer questions, to address issues. And so if you're here today, you're on the call, I'd love to hear from you, uh, where you're coming in from, and also any questions that you have, issues that you're facing uh, as you look at disciple-making movements in your area. And I'm just really excited to be here today. I hope we'll have a bunch of you on the call. And uh, we have some great questions that have been sent in ahead of time that I'm going to be answering. Today I'm going to be talking about baptism. And baptism is a huge issue for us in disciple-making movements and helping people take that step of obedience to follow Christ in everything, to become obedient disciples, to shift their allegiance from former religions or former things, to shift over to following Jesus with their whole heart and their whole life. And it's an important step. So I'm going to be talking about baptism today. There's some great questions that have come in this week on the issue of baptism. And I also have a question from Sandra Ross uh, having to do with Discovery Bible Studies. And what do you do when somebody has uh, been attending a Discovery Bible Study, um, but they aren't, they aren't coming to faith, they aren't making that decision, and they're not sharing with others? What do you do in that circumstances? So, circumstance. So I'm also going to be talking about that today. Um, so again, let me know if you're on the call, where you're coming in from, just go ahead and type that in. I'd love to see where you're coming from and say hi. Uh, and I uh, also, if you have any issues you've come to the call with that you want addressed today, put them there in the chat and I'd love to respond. So again, I'm C. Anderson, Disciple Making Movement trainer and coach. And I'm looking forward to answering your questions on these very, very important issues. So we have a question from Edwin. And Edwin, thanks for sending this in ahead of time. And Edwin asks about baptism of disciples. Will the disciple maker baptize on his own? So I, I hope I understand your question correctly, Edwin. I think what you're asking is, uh, the person who has led that person to faith, can they go ahead and be the person who baptizes the new, uh, the new believer, the new follower and disciple? Or uh, does it need to be someone who's ordained? That's a big question that comes up a lot as we train disciple makers around the world and a very important one for us to answer today. So um, yeah, the first thing that I wanna say about this is we always have to go back when we have these kinds of questions, uh, we always have to go back to the example that Jesus gave, right? Jesus is who we are disciples of ourselves. We're following Jesus. We wanna be like him. We wanna act like him. We wanna do the things that he did. And he said in his word that his disciples would do even greater things than he had done. Isn't that just incredible? I love that scripture. It builds faith in my heart that he told me that I would do even greater things than him, but at least I want to try my best in everything to follow his model, to follow his example. And a lot of times, you know, we're very influenced by the examples around us. Uh, we're very influenced by what we've seen and experienced already in our, in our journey, right, with Christ and as we've become a Christian or a follower of Jesus. And a lot of times the, um, the patterns that we see in the world today are not actually what Jesus and the apostles did. And in this issue of baptism, I want to take you first back to what Jesus said. Right? What did Jesus say about this? And we look, uh, probably the primary verse we can look at is the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. What did Jesus say? Jesus commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, and then what? To baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and to teach them to obey everything that he had commanded. So right there in the Great Commission, we see that Jesus gave authority. In fact, that verse starts out, it says, all authority in heaven and on earth, heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and do these things, right? So Jesus had authority 
that was given him by the Father. He was God. He had authority, and he gave that authority to his disciples to do what? To go make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to train them to obey all of his commands. So we see that Jesus said right there in that verse that everyone who is his follower, hey, George and Vitaly, good to see you guys here. And um, yeah, if you have any questions or issues you want to add into the mix, please feel free. But Jesus said right there in that verse, he said that we should go and make disciples and baptize them. Now, it's so interesting to me that we, you know, in our humanness, we so easily can just kind of cross out different bits of scripture and ignore them, right? So we would all say, I mean, you probably wouldn't meet a Christian today, an evangelical Christian who would say, this great commission is for everyone. It's not just for special people. We all are to be involved in going, making disciples, reaching the world. <clears throat> but so often we, we, we just cut out that little baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? We, we remove that from the Great Commission and we say, oh, that part is only for people who are ordained. That part is only for people who've done four or eight years of Bible college or seminary and they've been ordained by a church. They're highly qualified. They're the only ones who can do that particular kind of work of baptizing people or that ceremony. And yet we find no basis for this in scripture. Actually, absolutely no basis for that in scripture. That's not something that Jesus and his followers practiced. Jesus empowered his followers to go and make disciples and baptize. We see his disciples baptizing people. We see their disciples baptizing people. We see when the Holy Spirit came on the, the uh, gathering in Acts chapter 2, they went out. They made disciples and they baptized people. They didn't wait for the apostles to come. The apostles also baptized people, but it was not uh, it was not a requirement. And especially we see in the New Testament when the uh, when the believers were scattered due to persecution, they went everywhere and they led people to follow Jesus. They helped people make that decision and come to Christ as they shared the stories of Jesus with them. And then they baptized them wherever they went. There wasn't any kind of um, training people had to go through or special kind of qualification for baptism. So Edwin, to answer your question, if we look at the biblical model first, um, and we look at Jesus and the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles practice and what they did in the New Testament as their movement, the New Testament movement was growing and spreading all over the world, we do see that ordinary believers, disciples of Jesus, were empowered by Jesus himself to make disciples and to baptize those who they made disciples of. And that's the way new churches were formed and began to spread these house churches and churches that spread all throughout the Roman Empire at that time. So that's number one as we look at the example of Jesus. But another um, important thing that I want to mention about this is that we also want to look at the priesthood of all believers. In Second Peter, it talks about how we are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood. And this is something that we see is a dramatic change in the New Testament from the Old Testament pattern that, uh, that in the New Testament, there's no longer the Levitical priesthood who were especially um, uh, ordained by God to do the work of the ministry in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit comes, when Jesus dies on the cross and that curtain is torn open, we see that every ordinary believer has the same access to the Father. Every ordinary believer can do the work of the ministry. And in Second Peter, God calls them a royal priesthood. What does that mean? That means we have been ordained by Jesus in the Great Commission. We have been ordained uh, by God as royal priests. We've been given authority to do the work of the ministry. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't honor and respect people who have done further training, those who are ordained and who are pastors. There's many things that we can learn from them. There's many ways we need to honor and revere them. But this particular thing of uh, restricting baptism and restricting uh, people from being able to obey the command of Jesus 
uh, unless someone who is ordained is present and able to do that work, this is not a New Testament practice. And so thus, it's not something that we must practice either, but we can be free to follow Jesus' command and to empower others to do that as well. George, I see your question. That's great. Uh, let me get to that in just a minute. So the priesthood of all believers uh, is such an important concept as we think about multiplication and movements around the world. So we see the New Testament pattern, number one, uh, Edwin. And then the second thing that we want to look at is um, best practices in disciple-making movements today. And this is something that we have learned and studied and seen around the world in places where rapid multiplication is happening in places where we're seeing not just two or three generations of disciples and house churches, but we are seeing, you know, tens and 15 generations and things are multiplying, not just into the thousands, but into the tens of thousands. In every one of those uh, movements, we see that ordinary believers are empowered to baptize, to serve the Lord's Supper, to do everything that Jesus commanded that there's no restrictions on their um, authority in that way, but everyone is empowered to obey what Jesus commanded us to do in the Great Commission. So we see that best practice, and I um, have experienced this a lot in uh, the different movements I've been working with um, in India and Nepal, different places, um, and seen that in Africa as well, that when you restrict baptism to only the ordained pastor, you, you dramatically limit the growth that can happen and the multiplication factor in your movement. Uh, just the other day, I was coaching someone in India and we were talking about this issue. And I wanna to move to the next question, which is a question that he asked. Uh, and it has to do with COVID-19 and baptisms. So uh, once again, I'm C. Anderson. There's some new people have come on the call. C. Anderson. And I'm a disciple making movements trainer and coach. And I'm sharing today some answers to questions that people are asking, especially about baptism and about discovery groups. So um, yeah, going back to this question that my, my friend who I was coaching in India asked uh, yesterday of me, he said, is it okay to delay baptism during the COVID-19 crisis? Um, and then he also asked, why is it such a big issue? Uh, why is baptism such a big issue in disi disciple making movements? Um, and uh, yeah, so what do we do during COVID-19, right? Um, where churches are not allowed to gather, big groups are not allowed to gather, people are in, are in lockdown, and yet many people are coming to Christ. When I was talking with my friend yesterday, uh, he was telling me there's greater openness right now than he's ever seen before, ever seen before in his lifetime in India. More people are receiving Christ, more people are open to receive Christ than ever before. In fact, he was telling me just the day before, he had received about 15 phone calls from people who were interested in Christ and he was leading them to the Lord on the phone together with the husband or wife, uh, gathering them and leading them in repentance and putting their faith in Christ. And that was so exciting, incredible openness around the world today. Right, and so um, that's that's a wonderful thing, but we must always remember that we don't want to make converts, right? We want to make disciples. And what is a disciple? A disciple is someone who's accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior and made a decision to follow Jesus in obedience to his commands. Remember that last part of the Great Commission, train them to obey, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So a disciple of Jesus, which is what we want to make, we want to make disciples and disciple makers, is um, someone who obeys the command of Christ, including the command to be baptized. So even during COVID-19, we must, as disciple makers, find ways to help people obey Jesus, right? To, to open the pathway. And Jesus in the, in the Bible, when he talks about those who block newborn babes from obedience, he says, you know, you should tie a millstone around their neck and cast them into the sea. He is very, very strong about anyone who puts restrictions and blockages on newborn Christians 
becoming obedient and growing in their faith. And baptism is such an important step in obedience to Christ. It's the outward expression of our faith in Jesus. It's, it's that symbolic time where we say, what happened on the inside, I'm going to make it public. I'm going to declare my change of allegiance to follow Jesus with my whole heart for my whole life. It's such an important step of obedience. And in fact, um, with many of those that we're training, we, we don't even count anymore what we call believers. We're only counting disciples. And to be considered a disciple, you must be willing to be baptized. So baptism is such an important step. And even during the COVID-19 crisis, we have to look at how we can help people to be baptized. Um, but that may not be able to happen in the traditional ways that you've been used to doing it. Again, when I was talking with my friend in India, he was sharing, um, oh, hi, Melody, good to see you coming in from Brazil. Uh, glad to have you on the call today. And feel free to put in any questions that you have. Um, but good to see you. I, uh, we, we have lots of new people in Brazil who are studying disciple making movements and that is so encouraging. Really excited about what God is doing in Brazil today. But uh, getting back to this question, we have um, with disciple making movements and baptism during COVID-19, many times people are stuck in their old ways of baptizing people. And they think that it needs to be a ceremony in a church building with a baptism tank. Um, in fact, my friend who I was coaching, he was telling me they have hundreds of house churches, but then they, they have seven churches that are traditional church buildings where they have baptism tanks and they have two or 300 believers in those churches. And he said, that's where we usually baptize people. So we can't do that now during COVID-19. And uh, I was just explaining to him um, about what the Bible says about this and how we need to look at the New Testament model and that, you know, we don't know how long COVID-19 is going to continue. We don't know how long lockdowns will continue. We don't know how long there will be restricted access to uh, church buildings and gather large gatherings. But why should we restrict people from being baptized? The main hang up that's there is we have not empowered ordinary believers to do this work. And so uh, I just want to encourage you, uh, Edwin and uh, my friend in India and others who are on the call, find ways to empower ordinary believers to baptize others. Don't wait for the ordained minister to come. Don't wait for the big gathering. Uh, when you're thinking of where can you baptize, baptize wherever there's water. You know, we find that in the example of the Ethiopian eunuch when he came to faith through Philip, right? Uh, we see that, um, we see that when he came to faith through Philip, the question that was asked was, where is water? Oh, there's some water right there. Let's go ahead. Let's baptize you here in the water. It was an immediate, uh, as soon as they found water, boom, they made it happen. They made a way for that Ethiopian eunuch to be baptized. So uh, you can baptize in all kinds of creative ways. Baptisms can happen in bathtubs. Bathtub, bath, baptisms can happen in ponds or streams. Um, in Kenya, I was encouraging uh, Leonard and his group, find a, a water tank, you know, one of these black water barrels, and you know fill it with water put the person in there let them squat down and baptize them um, if you need to and you really have a shortage of water you can dump a, a water over their head there's no restriction on that but it is important to let people take that step of being baptized and of obeying jesus in that way okay so we've got some great questions here i want to uh, go to those george you have a question after making disciples and you plan to baptize them, is it wrong to baptize in the sea? It's always a flowing river. Does it always need to be in a river? So um, yeah, great question. Uh, no, it's not wrong to baptize them in the sea. Um, and it's not wrong to baptize them in the bathtub or like I just talked about, you can baptize them in a water tanky. You know, you can um, find a barrel that uh, is, you know, you can fill with water, um, whatever you need to do. What is important is not where you baptize them. What is important is that you enable them 
to obey the command of Jesus, right? And the location doesn't matter, the means doesn't matter, but what matters is what takes place in their heart, right? Mm -hmm. As they take that step of obedience and faith, and as they declare their faith in Jesus uh, in that symbolic ceremony that Jesus commanded us to do, that is very, very important. Uh, it's, it's that we do baptism that matters, not how we do baptism. And there's lots of theological debates. I know I worked in Northeast India where, you know, the Baptists and the Presbyterians, they would go at each other and, you know, have these long discussions about sprinkling baptism or immersion baptism. And I, I really want to encourage you as DMM practitioners, don't get hung up on the, the how, right? Uh, but what you do want to be really committed to is the what. And the what is that we must obey Jesus because that's what a disciple is. And when you have obedient disciples who follow Jesus in all of his commands, not just baptism, but all of his commands, but including baptism, you're going to see much greater multiplication. So, um, yes, George, go ahead, baptize them in the sea, baptize them in a water tanky, uh, do whatever you need to do. Um, and empower your local local leaders, your local believers to also go ahead and do the work of baptism uh, and uh, perform that as royal priests of God. Okay, Vitaly, uh, what type of relationship you had with the next generations of churches started in DMM? Did you form any kind of network of churches or a fellowship of churches? And is there a need to care for next generations and how far? Okay, that's a great question. And um, yeah, let's go ahead and just go to that. So um, what relationship do the different generations have to one another and to the, uh, the pioneer of the movement or the movement leader? And um, really, Vitaly, the, uh, sorry if I'm not saying your name right, you're going to have to send me a voicemail or something so I know how to pronounce it correctly. But the closest relationships you will have will be with the first generation churches that you yourself start and with the leaders that you are training, right? Um, and for the, the groups that they begin, the second and third and fourth generation, tenth generation, the groups that they start, you may visit them occasionally as an observer. You might want to go see what it looks like that those you're training are doing so that you can give them further input. But you want to be very, very careful not to become, as the movement uh, catalyst or the movement leader or trainer, you don't want to become the, the big leader that everybody waits for and um, you know wants to see come to visit their house church or uh, so you you want to trust the Holy Spirit and trust the leaders that you're training to uh, put into practice the things that you're training them and and to become the true leaders at each generation that they are leading their people they are training their people they are making disciples of those that God has given them and um, so you want to care for the leaders. Now, sometimes you're going to be bringing in all of the different house church leaders into a gathering if you're able to gather maybe after COVID-19 and giving them additional training all together. Sometimes you're going to identify who are your most fruitful leaders. So you may have people who are at the second generation, the fifth generation, the seventh generation, and you see, wow, this person is a very fruitful leader and you're going to bring them in to be a uh, part of that inner circle that you're training very closely, who you're really investing in. But you want to be careful mm -hmm. that you don't take over or that um, what can often happen, I've seen this happen many, many times, is uh, the leaders at the first generation or the team that started that movement, uh, someone from the fourth or fifth generation will be uh, sick and they will call the big, big leader to come and pray rather than um, empowering the local believers to do that work in the ministry themselves and to believe and say, hey, I'm with you, I'm praying for you, but you go for it, you're the leader there. Uh, so you do wanna be careful about that. Did you form any kind of network of churches or a fellowship of churches? Um, yes, we did. And uh, different kinds of associations can be formed of all the different churches in the movement. Um, especially if you're in a country where you need some sort of legal 
uh, format or legal standing um, that has been done there uh, to form a, a more official movement um, that gets registered with the government. But the thing that you have to be so careful about when you do that is often when we get organized like that, the movement will slow down and the movement will um, not continue to grow so rapidly. And then somehow we just get into this mindset that now we need to have our women's programs and now we need to have our youth programs for all this association of churches. And now we need to look at ordination and a lot of negative things can happen as well. So you wanna look at that issue very, very carefully. Uh, but I have seen that happen in some places and uh, be positive. I've also seen it uh, happen and be negative. Um, so I would suggest instead of that, actually, um, that you consider looking at a loose network and training those leaders. And there's no control because of name. It's not like, oh, you're part of this movement or this denomination, but that the leadership happens through deep discipleship and deep relationship at every level, at every generation. And uh, as you disciple people well and really invest in their lives, you're going to have great influence in their lives and in what they're doing as you feed them, as you train them, as you mentor them, as you invest in them, as you help them troubleshoot the problems that they come up with, you're going to see that they're going to be committed um, and, and loyal, if you want to say, to that movement and to that vision that you're promoting as you vision cast regularly. regularly and all of those things are actually like the glue that makes a movement stick together uh, much more than a registered association or registered name. Um, and so, yeah, you do need to provide care for the leaders um, in the movement, but I would be cautious about providing care for the local believers that they are discipling. That's the job that, that they must do as those leaders of those groups. So I hope, Vitaly, that helped a bit. Let me know if, uh, if it did or not, or if you have any questions. Um, so going back to Linda, hey, thanks for your question here. Uh, Linda says, this is very interesting and rich subject. My question today was answered about the types of baptisms. Okay, awesome. So good uh, that you got an answer to that. Um, and uh, yeah, another, question that came up um, had to do with, uh, again, on baptism, why is this such a big issue? So um, again, just going back to why is the issue of baptism such a, such a thing that many of us as disciple making movement trainers, we talk about this a lot, we emphasize it, and really the, the reason why it's so important is it has to do with obedience to Christ's commands. And um, that's very central to what a disciple-making movement is. If we look at the characteristics of a disciple-making movement, and you can find that on my blog, um, uh, go to dmmsfrontiermissions.com and uh, go to the bottom of that where it says blog, and then, then look for the article called uh, What is a DMM? And right there, you're gonna see um, one of the top four characteristics of a DMM is obedient disciples. So obedience-based discipleship is what we talk about. And again, without obedience to Christ and that commitment, we don't want to just make converts. We don't want to just make believers. We don't want to just lead people in a sinner's prayer, right? Or, or make church members, but we want to train disciples who then become disciple makers, who make more disciples, who make more disciples. And that requires that right from the beginning, we, uh, we ask them to take that step of baptism. And we see that's, that's again, so biblical. I had forgotten before I was gonna to read to you from Acts chapter two, so let me just do that, and then I'm gonna to get to Sandra's question. Uh, in Acts chapter two, uh, we know that's where Pentecost happened, right? The Holy Spirit's poured out, and after that, Peter stands up and he addresses the crowd and he shares with them about Jesus and how uh, in the last days, God said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters would prophesy. He then goes into, uh, in verse 21, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He shares this powerful message with the crowd that had gathered. 
And then he, he calls them in verse 38, he says this, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. That was in response to the question in the verse above, brothers, what shall we do? So he shares the gospel with conviction, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They say, what do we need to do to, <coughs> to follow Jesus? And he responds with these two things, right? So he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What two things did they need to do? They needed to repent and they needed to be baptized. So we see both in the commands of Jesus and in this, uh, this you know, practice of Peter at Pentecost is two really important things have to happen. It's not just intellectual consent to say, I believe Jesus is God, I believe he died and rose again, but it's repentance and faith in him and that followed up by an act of obedience of being baptized. And we see that after he said that in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 were baptized immediately as they repented and put their faith in Christ. And you know, I, I sincerely doubt, we don't know for sure, but I can, I can assume that Peter didn't do all that baptizing, right? He didn't uh, baptize every single one of those 3,000 people, but he baptized some and they probably baptized other and the other disciples that were there, they baptized people and they got the job done, right? <laughs> they, they helped people take that step of repentance and faith and baptism. There wasn't a two or three month process of understanding more, of testing to see if they were true believers or not, of letting them stop smoking and drinking and worshiping idols first or any of that. We don't see that as the pattern that Peter followed. We don't see that as Jesus' pattern, but when there's repentance, they said, I repent, I'm turning to Jesus. I know he's the savior. I turn from my sin. I put my faith and trust in him. When they do that, baptism happened that same day. So again, uh, baptism is such an important thing because it is that outward sign of obedience and obedient disciples, those who from the very beginning commit to follow Jesus, not just in their mind, but in their actions, and that they are going to turn to him and obey his commands, including being baptized. Those are the ones who we see begin to make disciples who make disciples. So I hope that's helpful to you. And um, yeah, Melody and George and the others who are on the call, uh, let me know if there's anything that you still need more clarity on regarding baptism. Um, but once again, I'm C. Anderson, for those of you new coming on the call. I'm a Disciple Making Movement trainer and coach. I have a blog at dmmsfrontiermissions.com where I write about disciple making movements and issues every week. You can sign up to get that in your email as well. And um, you'll be encouraged and inspired as well as equipped in your disciple making efforts. I wanna answer Sandra's question, which is on a little bit different topic here. And she says, I am doing a DBS for a while with someone who, although interested, has not yet become a Christian and doesn't yet want to share with others. When should I stop meeting up with her and how do I finish well? So that's a really wonderful question to be asking and a, a very real issue that we face as we begin discovery groups with people who are seekers, who are interested, they're willing to study the Bible, um, and then we begin to lead them in those discovery, discovery groups um, and we see that they, you know, it happens. Some, some people want to study the Bible, but they don't want to obey Jesus and uh, they aren't ready yet to take that step. So as a disciple making movement practitioner, Sandra, you have limited time, right? And you have limited energy and you want to invest your time and energy and those who are willing to take steps of obedience. So I would say with this person that if you see steps of obedience happening, you might continue another few weeks, you know, or even a month uh, with them. Uh, if they are just 
learning, they enjoy the fellowship, they enjoy meeting you because they like you, but they're not willing to take steps of obedience, then I would go ahead and discontinue that and put your energy towards uh, abundant seed sowing with new people, sharing with new people, um, starting new groups um, with others. And uh, that is a, it's a hard decision to make. I've made that myself. Um, and the longer you've been meeting with them, the actually the harder it is because um, there's, a, there's a love and a relationship there. And it's hard to stop those groups because you don't want to give up hope for this person that you've been praying for and working with. And um, I really understand the, the challenge that is there. But if we continue working mm -hmm. with people who are not obedient, not willing to take steps of obedience, what that is actually doing is it's preventing you, Sandra, from meeting other people who God has prepared and who are ripe for harvest. And so you have to say no to some things in order to say yes to other things. And you wanna say yes to those people that God's prepared and made ready. And I think that's why Jesus, you know, he told his disciples in Luke chapter 10, where he was describing finding a person of peace, that if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet and go on, right? And he talks about that in Luke chapter 10, that we can't just keep investing and investing and investing our lives in people who aren't ready to receive the message of Jesus and to become obedient disciples of him. So, um, you should probably stop if she's not taking steps of obedience um, and uh, you know pray about it maybe give it another week or two um, one thing i've also seen happen and this is a question you could ask yourself is have you really asked her to do that you know or him if it's a guy have you have you really brought that challenge uh, before them and invited them to take that step Sometimes we, we have these Bible studies, but we never really invite people to take a step of obedience. So if you haven't been very, very clear about that, you might want to keep meeting another time or two and make a clear invitation. Say, you know, I've been meeting with you for six weeks or for eight weeks, and we've been studying the Bible, and it's been so great to have you interested in this. Um, you know, are you ready to take that next step? to follow Jesus and to um, to begin to obey his commands to be baptized I would invite them to take the step of baptism and repentance um, and then if they're not ready how do you discontinue that um, you just you know say hey it's been great to meet with you um, I'd love to continue to get together from time to time but um, our our series is finishing you know you can kind of say it that way you know we've gone through this series of Bible studies and um, you know we're, we're going to be finishing next week and uh, it's been so great to be with you and you know leave it leave it as that um, you know you could you could say hey if you are interested to learn more and study more the next level that we go to in this is to uh, invite people who want to be baptized and who want to start to share with others this is the next step and you can consider whether or not you're ready for that I hope that helps Sandra but just make it very very clear be friendly um, you know don't you don't stop being friends with them or stop having any contact with them uh, but you do want to stop investing so regularly uh, in that person if they're not obeying and how long is that period you know and people ask me that as well and you didn't really ask that but let me just address that question also how many discovery bible studies do you have with someone before you invite them to take make a decision to follow jesus uh, to make a decision to um, to be baptized to move forward in their faith and um, my you know there's nothing again in scripture that says do this many or do that you know um uh, we do see that Jesus called people quickly to a higher level of discipleship and to a higher level of obedience of his commands. And he didn't invest a lot of time in those who weren't ready to obey. Uh, but I'll just tell you, my practice is about six weeks. Um, if after six weeks of investing in someone in relationship, I'm not outside of the meeting as well, sharing my life, 
um, studying the Word of God with them, if they haven't begun to take some pretty serious steps of faith and obedience and repentance, and if they're not ready to begin to share those stories with others, if they're not ready to call together others to hear, um, if I don't see any of that, then I'm going to discontinue that in a polite way and try to put my energy elsewhere. Um, you know, again, one of the things I've seen sometimes with groups is, um, yeah, you might meet, some groups meet for a year or two years learning the stories of Jesus without ever giving the invitation. And um, just from my perspective, I feel like that's a mistake. And why is it a mistake? Um, I believe that's a mistake because God has prepared for you ripe harvest out there. And he's prepared for you persons of peace that you need to go and find. And you're not going to have time to go and find them if you're investing all this time in people who aren't ripe yet, or they're not ready yet, or they're not persons of peace um, who can then multiply to others. So, Sandra, I hope that's helpful. It's not an easy thing. I'll be praying for you as you think about that and um, process that with the Lord and uh, take those steps. But again, uh, it, it can feel a little bit unloving, you know, to say, hey, I'm not willing to study with you anymore unless you're willing to be baptized and decide to take a step to follow Jesus. And of course, you don't want to say it that way. It can feel unloving, but really what you're doing is you're, you're displaying with your priorities um, a love for the lost who are waiting and ready ready to respond and they are out there Sandra they are out there uh, but you have to go out and find them and that takes time and so invest your top priority in finding those persons of peace who are ready to respond and don't feel bad you know it actually is not uncommon uh, to see discovery uh, groups that are started with seekers discontinue I think I heard it's up to about you know 75 80 percent of those groups that are started with seekers start for a while and then discontinue so you're not alone in that uh, you shouldn't feel bad about that just remember the parable of the soils again that not everyone who shows interest in the beginning grows up to become a fruit-bearing disciple uh, 30 60 and 100 fold and that's normal that's natural uh, so you you probably need to go ahead and do that and get in the habit of doing that and then move on and invest in new people. And I believe that, you know, as we say no to certain things and yes to others, that God is going to meet you in that time. Um, there's a great book that was written by uh, Henry Cloud called Necessary Endings. And if you haven't read that, it's a really good book. But he talks about the importance of stopping certain things so you can make space and room in your life for new things and the things that are really important. And um, it can be hard, but it's an important step to take as we look at disciple making. So yeah, it's been great to be with you guys today. Any, any last questions any of you who are on the call have? Otherwise, we're gonna wrap up. But uh, thanks so much. We will be meeting uh, next week again on Friday at the same time. I look forward to seeing you guys there again, uh, here again. And um, we, I'm not sure if we're gonna continue through the summer. I might be taking a break. So it may be that uh, next Friday will be our last Q&A time until the fall. Uh, but um, really enjoyed doing this and being with you. Those of you guys, there's a number of you who show up every Friday for this time. And I so enjoy interacting with you. So God bless you guys. Um, have, a, have a great week and um, go out and make disciples, multiply disciples, make those tough decisions, move forward, go after that biblical model, follow Jesus and his pattern, stick to the patterns that Jesus taught us and you're gonna see amazing fruit. You're gonna see your movement begin to grow in organic, multiplicative ways and uh, just believe that God is working through you. Take advantage of this incredible season of openness and harvest to bring people into the kingdom, but don't stop there. When you invite someone to follow Jesus and they say yes, get them obeying his commands and taking those next steps of obedience to obey what he taught us. All right, you guys have a great week and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.